we'll dive right in. Uh, well, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome. And welcome to this uh, pre-election uh, really special forum brought to you by the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies and the Advanced Nuclear Weapons Alliance Deterrence Center. Our forum today is being recorded. Uh, so uh, and it's also open to the press. I'm Jeff Crater and I'll be your host for the next hour or so. And I'm joined by uh, my ANWA Deterrence Center co-founder, David Charrington, who will moderate the question and answers. So please uh, have your uh, questions ready for our panelists. I'm also joined by uh, Peter Husey, uh, the Director of Strategic Deterrence Studies at the Mitchell Institute. We're grateful for our partnership and focus on the NNSA, the cornerstone of our strategic nuclear deterrent. Uh, let me now take the opportunity to turn it over to Peter for his remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you very much, David, and welcome to Madeline and uh, Bill. I just wanted to make a note. Um, General Hyten recently said that Without NNSA and the warhead modernization effort, uh, we don't have a nuclear deterrent. And he was particularly talking about the uh, cuts within the House Appropriations Committee. Also, I wanted to also make a note for those interested in nuclear things that I have a new nuclear blog. It's a weekly blog on the Maven Warrior website. Every Thursday goes up a new essay of mine, plus if you have nice things you would like me to post on the website, uh, Chris Osborne, who runs it, who also is a uh, fellow here at the Mitchell Institute, uh, be delighted to post that as well. Uh, so uh, that's a, a, a new blog to uh, help us understand the issues we're facing. And that's all I have, Jeff and David. And again, thank you for being our partners on this as well. Thanks very much, Peter. And, and let, me, let me just say, uh, to all of you out there, uh, we really have a special treat for you today. We have two really outstanding speakers um, who both happen to be on our bipartisan Advanced Nuclear Weapons Alliance Deterrence, Deterrence Center Board of Advisors, which is co-chaired by former Senator Ben Nelson, a Democrat from Nebraska, and former Representative Zach Womp, a Republican from Tennessee. Uh, we welcome Malin Creed and Bill Ostendorf to our forum today, both of whom have left uh, their enduring mark on our deterrent by helping to secure its future and with it credibility. And with whom I've had the absolute privilege of working with or getting to know in their capacity as professional staff on the House Armed Services Committee or Senate Armed Services Committee or in DOE pre-NSA and really after NSA was formed in 2000. A lot of different places where our paths have crossed. Um, for details on their backgrounds, we've sent you their bios uh, early this afternoon. Well, um, both come from opposite political parties and occasionally uh, with a few different vantage points. Nonetheless, as former uh, US national security leaders, we are grateful for their contributions to revitalizing and modernizing the NNSA and ensuring a cre credible strategic nuclear deterrent. They are a credit to the longstanding uh, bipartisan nature of support for our strategic det nuclear deterrent from one administration to the next. So, um, let, let me just give uh, two examples of uh, what I consider the, uh, the enduring bipartisanship of support for our strategic nuclear deterrent. Here's an example from a Democratic administration, that of uh, President Obama, where uh, Secretary of uh, um, Defense Ash Carter um, said, the bedrock of our military capability and our security remains nuclear deterrence. And then he also uh, went on to say, as he told Politico in February of 2018, I am very, was very grateful to President Obama for reaching what I obviously thought was the right conclusion, which is that it was necessary to recapitalize the nuclear triad and I'm glad that he made that decision and he did. So from the current administration, uh, President Trump's Secretary of Defense Mark Esper said recently, modernizing the nuclear strategic triad is a top priority of our military. It's key to our nation's defense it provides that strategic nuclear deterrent that we depend on day after day, and we depended on decade after decade. So really uh, starting under Obama and doubling down under President Trump with bipartisan support from our Congress, you know, we've really stopped kicking the can on strategic nuclear deterrence. 
We're on a 30 year, uh, $1.2 trillion trajectory to maintain and modernize our deterrent by replacing the B-2s by continuing to fly B-52s with the air launch cruise missile and in the future, the long range standoff missile because frankly, B-52s lack the stealth. We'll replace both B-2 and B-52 eventually with a B-21 starting in 2030, running through about 2050. Plus we're adding nuclear capable F-35s and on land, we're replacing the Miniman 3 with a ground-based strategic deterrent or GBSD and modern ICBMs. At sea, 14 Ohio-class submarines with 12 Columbias with upgraded Trident II D-5 missiles. NNSA, as we said before, the cornerstone of our deterrent has been modernizing throughout the decade, but much more needs to be done at the weapons plants and laboratories to maintain, in many cases, restore capability, restore what we've let atrophy since the end of the Cold War. Uh, that is to manufacture the nuclear materials and some of the warheads themselves. So our panelists today, uh, Madeline Creed, who served under President Clinton and Obama at DOE and DOD and was the number two at the NNSA, and Bill Osterdorf, who also served, uh, who, who served under President George W. Bush, uh, but also served as Deputy Administrator at NSA, will help us hash through what we might expect uh, for deterrence policy and modernization uh, over the next four years under a new Biden administration or a second term uh, for President Trump. Madeline, uh, I hand it over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to, um, to be here uh, and certainly to appear here with, uh, with, with Bill, um, longstanding colleague. Uh, you know, we've, we've shared, we've shared many a debate, many of a discussion, um, and, uh, and frankly, many a long night as we worked through uh, various aspects of the, of the NDAA over our years past. Um, and also thank you, Jeff, Dave, Peter, uh, for the invitation, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I've, I, I, of course, have to start with uh, the normal caveats that I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody today, uh, including my dog, um, and that these are all just my personal thoughts. You know, Yogi, Yogi Berra famously said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And so given that today is November 2nd and tomorrow is November 3rd, uh, I'm going to take his advice and I'm not even gonna try, uh, which means I will look a bit into the past and reassess where we are today and how we got here. Um, but because I have just a few minutes, uh, I promise I won't go back into the history of the Manhattan Project, although some of the folks who were part of that effort would be very much at home, even today in some of the NNSA buildings. Uh, where I want to start really is with President Obama's Prague speech in 2009. Well, that speech is best remembered for resurrecting the goal of seeking the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. In essence, reinforcing the commitment by the US and the other acknowledged nuclear weapon states in the NPT. President Obama also was very clear about the nuclear stockpile reducing the number and role of nuclear weapons in the US security policy while maintaining a nuclear arsenal that is safe, secure, and effective for as long as nuclear weapons exist is a key driver towards a world without nuclear weapons. So that's an important aspect. That's an important item to remember that there really is a link between a world without nuclear weapons and also a safe, secure, and effective stockpile and deterrent. One of Obama's very first goals, of course, was to seek the New START Treaty uh, to set a cap on operationally deployed strategic weapons for both the United States and Russia. That treaty has been successful. Both sides are in compliance. And it is the force structure of 2010 and the 2018 nuclear posture reviews, and in turn, all the US nuclear modernizations are based. The Navy and the Air Force work on the nuclear delivery systems and nuclear command and control, and the NNSA work on the warhead programs is all shaped by the caps in the New START Treaty. But those caps in that treaty are now in question as there is significant uncertainty on the future of the treaty 
and whether it will be extended before it expires on February 5th. The administration's effort to expand the treaty to encompass China and all non-strategic weapons have not proved successful. Although talks are still reportedly ongoing with Russia to work on a framework to allow for an extension of less than the full five years provided under the treaty. Press reports even as of yesterday hint that a deal with a one-year extension perhaps may still be in the offing. On the other hand, Defense News is reporting that President Putin in a call with members of the Security Council said, referring to the New START Treaty that, and this is a quote, the negotiations on that crucial issue important, not just for us, in other words, Russia and the United States, but for the entire world had failed to start. Well, that certainly doesn't bode well for any new arms control treaty, particularly new treaties with Russia to address non-strategic systems, but of course time will tell. And while on the topic of treaties, another goal of the Obama administration was to finally ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the CTBT. Well, that didn't happen given some of the accusations made last year, notably by the head of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, about possible inconsistencies in nuclear experiments by Russia and China ratification of the CTBT would actually be a good opportunity to resolve any of these concerns. The, so the, um, the, head of the, the head of the DIA at the time said, the United States believes that Russia is not adhering to the nuclear testing moratorium in a manner consistent with the zero yield standard. And with, and with respect to China, he said, China's actions in expanding their stockpile and their lack of transparency, quote, raise questions as to whether China could achieve such progress without, with activities, without activities inconsistent with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, so Lieutenant General Robert Ashley, who made those comments uh, during, uh, during remarks uh, was very unclear and, uh, but, but nevertheless have planted the seeds. So although Russia has ratified the CTBT, the US and China have not. Ratification by China and the US would, could, would and could have an effect not only on the US, China and Russia resolving some of these uncertainties as raised by General, General Ashley uh, with respect to compliance with the treaty, it could also have an effect on North Korea possibly bringing pressure on it to not resume nuclear weapons testing. And finally, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The ban treaty will come into force in January as the last three of the 50 countries needed for the treaty entry have ratified this past week. Of course, none of the states possessing nuclear weapons have ratified the treaty and all remain opposed. But clearly there's a growing frustration with the pace at which the weapon states are taking their NPT commitments, particularly countries like China and Russia, which are increasing the overall size of their nuclear arsenals. So I would certainly look and expect pressure from the international community and activists on the five nuclear weapon states to stop or limit their modernization programs. Given that the most the two most aggressive modernizers are also probably the least influenced by the pressure. It's an open question as to what the other three will do uh, in, the, in the face of this pressure. A lot has changed uh, over the last uh, four years and even more since the 2000 and Prague speech, not the least of which is the change in the threat environment. The world took a decidedly different path from the one envisioned by President Obama in 2009. Russia has mostly completed its strategic modernization as a, and has embarked on a significant program to expand the type and numbers of non-strategic weapons, including the so-called novel systems, such as Skyfall, the nuclear powered cruise missile, the Status 6 or Canyon, which is the nuclear powered autonomous undersea vehicle, and the avant-garde nuclear capable hypersonic vehicle deployed as Russia claims last year. China has also changed dramatically, seeking to be a global player, moving to a true triad, developing a vast array of missiles, some of which are dual capable, 
and setting forth a goal to at least double the size of its arsenal by 2035. This very different, more dangerous, less understood geopolitical environment has in turn led to a needed review and renewed understanding of the threat and what it means for deterrence. I would certainly expect a Biden-Harris administration to do a full bottom-up review of deterrence and the evolving threats and changing nuclear policies that the world now faces. Preparing to contend with Russia's policy that embraces the use of nuclear weapons and a Chinese no first use policy, which may not be completely credible, is clearly a new challenge, particularly as the probability of the use of nuclear weapons in a limited fashion as part of or to reduce the conventional conflict increases. Hopefully a review is part of an integrated national security, national defense strategy exercises where deterrence is examined as a whole, not by specific stovepipes, space, cyber, nuclear, et cetera, the way it's been done in the past. And any such deterrence review would, I hope, include the whole of government participation so that all the tools of deterrence, economic, diplomatic, and military can be explored and used most effectively to establish a strong deterrence posture. John Warden, has written an excellent article on one aspect of integrated deterrence. His article on conventional nuclear integration in the next national defense strategy is posted on the CNAS and also the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory websites. He argues that war plans for defeating or rolling back Russia or Chinese aggression must envision political objectives and a way of conducting operations that reduce the likelihood that an adversary will, re will risk nuclear ex escalation. And he argues that the way to do this is through this, among other things, conventional nuclear integration. It's definitely worth a read for an in-depth discussion of really a very complicated idea and you know, far beyond the, the scope of a, of a short talk today. Of course, there will also be a need to do a deep dive review of the actual nuclear force structure. You'll have to do this, Some uh, the next administration, whoever they are, will have to support future negotiations, but also to understand if the nuclear aspect of deterrence is capable to support the purposes for which it's desired. Questions including the role of nuclear weapons and deterrence, including extended deterrence, as well as targeting and other policies will have to be reviewed. NNSA must and should be a major player in all these reviews. I would note that sometimes NNSA is viewed as an afterthought, a supplier of goods and materials and not a policy player. Such a perception is a mistake as nuclear deterrence is, as Jeff mentioned at the outside, not possible without NNSA. Deterrence is in fact more than weapons. It's also nuclear nonproliferation, proliferation prevention, counterproliferation, and accident and incident response. As part of any review, options to prevent an accident or inadvertent nuclear conflict, as well as to prevent terrorist use of a nuclear or a radiological device must also be considered. All areas where NNSA plays the outsized role. Moreover, if there is an opportunity to re-engage Iran, either by reinvigorating the JCPOA or seeking a new agreement, NNSA and all of DOE for that matter, will be indispensable to the technical underpinnings of any agreement, its implementation and inspection and verification. Similarly, if any progress is to be made with DPRK, NNSA will play a major role in any nuclear negotiations or nuclear disarmament implementation. And finally, we can't forget the work of the joint NNSA Navy Office of Nuclear Reactors. It needs the reactors designed by the NNSA. The last issue that I will touch on today is money and budgets. Pandemic-driven downward pressure on defense budgets is expected, of course, but budgetary pressure on nuclear modernization and the nuclear complex looks to be more acute, more complicated, and more contentious. The House Armed Services Committee Chairman Adam Smith, speaking at a recent CNAS event, 
indicated that he believes the Biden administration will consider a minimum deterrent nuclear architecture. Although candidate Biden, as reported in Stars and Stripes in September, does not foresee major reductions in the US defense budget. NNSA is particularly susceptible to budget pressure as every aspect of the NNSA budget is growing to accommodate the growing workload. The increasing NNSA budget underpins the press of life extension programs, but also must ensure that the science that is the base for all of the NNSA programs is robust. The complex, re regains its, the complex must also regain its abilities to produce needed materials, lithium and tritium, and eventually enriched uranium, and must regain the ability to produce all of the necessary elements of the stockpile, including plutonium pits and uranium parts, as well as non-nuclear components. With pressure, with pressure to refine promptly, the budget request for 2022 in advance of policy resolution, this will be the first test, debate, battleground, however you perceive it, for deterrence. So I'll stop there uh, with that sort of one over the world in 10 minutes. Uh, and I certainly look forward to questions and answers. Thanks. Thanks so much, Madeline. Uh, now we're gonna turn it over to, uh, to Bill Ostendorf for his remarks. Okay, Jeff, real quick, can you hear me all right? Yes, yeah, loud and clear. Very good. Well, good afternoon. Jeff and David and Peter, thanks for the invitation from Adam and myself. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here with all of you and I've known you guys for a long time. And we've always had a very positive interactions. Uh, Madeline and I uh, have, have a long history and I, I consider Madeline a superb public servant and a good friend. And Peter, I thank you for coming to help educate my future officers at the Naval Academy. You've done a great job as a guest lecturer. Uh, Hey, I was privileged to spend time during the George W. Bush administration at NSA. And while I was there, I, I fully encountered a team of professionals, all committed to national security. And while there I had a chance to be involved in deterrence policy, formulation, execution, I learned a lot. Uh, but I left there in 2009, spent a little over six years as a commissioner of the NRC. And for the last four years, I've been teaching political science at the Naval Academy. So rather than spending time as Central Technical Authority at NNSA looking at Los Alamos CMR building seismic margin with the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board or talking about the lessons learned from the reactor accident of Fukushima Daiichi, I'm now discussing grand strategy, geopolitics, and great power competition with our future officer corps in the Navy and Marine Corps. Before I go further, and this is where I really applaud ANWA's Deterrence Center and the Mitchell Institute for Space Studies, it is so essential that any administration, especially a new administration, fully understand what our nuclear deterrence mission is, how it's achieved, and how our national security depends upon its reliability and credibility. And if decision makers don't grasp the gravity and complexity of deterrence, nothing else matters. So again, my hat's off to Ann Wai and the Mitchell Institute. Uh, David Sherrington said I could tell one C story, so I'm gonna do one. Uh, and I'm gonna use this to, to drive home a point many years ago, but this is a point that has stuck with me for over 40 years. So I graduated from Naval Academy in 1976, attended a year of Admiral Rickover's nuclear power school and prototype, then went to submarine school. And I reported in the fall of 1977 to my first submarine, USS George Bancroft, SSBN 643, the gold crew. This is one of the 41 for freedom at the time. I get down there to Charleston with my wife, newly married, and the XO tells me next week, Bill, you're going to the emergency action message team training to become indoctrinated in nuclear command and control and in the single integrated operational plan or PSYOP, which is our nuclear war plan. This TSSCI level training was conducted unsurprisingly in a windowless skiff down in the bowels of a brick building. I've got to tell you that seeing the targets for our nuclear warheads carried in our submarine was a very sobering experience. I was 23 years old at the, 23 years old at the time and that made an impression on me. So I'm gonna fast forward a couple months in February, 1978. I'm now on the bridge of the Bancroft 
As we get underway for sea trials prior to our 75 day submerged deterrent patrol, we're going on sea trials out of our four deployed site in Rota, Spain. Now I'm not qualified to anything. I'm on the bridge as a junior officer to watch there just to observe. And this is my first underway on Bancroft. After clearing three miles from land, at that time that was the limit of territorial waters, I see a large trawler-like vessel parallel our course about 40 yards away. And I said, this is unusual. This doesn't look right. Now, I know we're on the surface. The water is too shallow to submerge. This vessel, I'm told by the, the, the officer deck and the captain, is a Soviet AGI or intelligence collection vessel. And it proceeded to record our ship's propeller noise signature by lowering hydrophones into the water via cables. It takes photos, takes movies, all of which is pretty uneventful, but then it starts to harass us by crisscrossing our bow with a CPA or closest point of approach of only 25 yards. Now for an 8,000 ton submarine with a nuclear reactor and 16 nuclear missiles on board, that's pretty close. We were concerned. As our submarine was being hazarded by this Soviet ship's actions, and by the way, it was violating the 1972 U.S.-USSR Agreement on Preventing Incidents at Sea, our submarine made an emergency radio call to our National Command Authority via what's called an OPREP-3 Navy Blue Report to report our situation and our actions. It was at this point that the reality of the Cold War and our nuclear weapons, and we're carrying 16 missiles on board, each of which has MIRV warheads, is that time when that reality hit home to me personally, and it was very, very sobering. Now, I'll note it took me over 18 months of training and until I got to my first submarine this underway to grasp the enormity of the ballistic missile submarine's role in strategic deterrence. And in the Soviet Cold War, where I played a very, very, very small role. That sea story never left me over 16 years of sea duty on six different submarines. I've carried the Poseidon strategic missile, the Trident D D5, Subrock, and TLAM N nuclear warheads. And that's an impression that I was left with that has never gone away. Now, I feel the same way about the bomber force and the ICBM force, those legs of the triad. I just don't have a sea story to share on those. So why did I tell this story? The reason is just to make the point that even for those serving in our nation's strategic nuclear forces, it takes some time and mental processing to understand the nuclear deterrence mission and grasp what is at stake. For those not directly involved without hands-on experience, it is far, far, far harder. Now, while those Cold War days are in the past, we are still engaged in great power competition today. Those nuclear weapons, those smaller number, are still with us. Thus, and this goes back to ANWA and the Mitchell Institute, there remains a very clear and compelling need to educate and inform members of Congress and the public of this vital deterrent mission. Now, I'm a bit removed from time serving at NSA. I am going to offer a few thoughts in the next four years. And these ideas, like Madeline said, are independent of who the next president is. So these are some thoughts for your consideration in maintaining our nuclear deterrence going forward. First, and this applies to either party, fill key leadership vacancies with highly qualified people as a top priority. Though there are many committed and dedicated professionals who very capably serve in an acting capacity, our nation needs permanent leaders who, quote, own the mission and are accountable to Congress and the public for the same. Now, I served as acting NSA administrator for four months in 2007. While I enjoyed great support from the NSA organization, I did not feel completely empowered the way I would have if I were in a permanent status. Second, and I'm glad there's some, I think, folks from the Hill on this call today, I urge you all to work with both parties in bipartisan fashion to educate members and staff on the deterrence mission. Briefings along party lines to members or staff should be the rare exception rather than the rule. I fondly recall the traditional practice between HASC and SASC circa 2003-2007 of bipartisan staff briefings where everyone was in the room 
irrespective of political party affiliation. Many of those briefings were with Madeline, from whom I learned a great deal. I believe that Bob DeGrasse or Rudy Barnes may be in the call. They were also in those briefings. I was on the Republican side, they were on the Democratic side. The bottom line is that nuclear deterrence and its role in safeguarding our country is simply too important to treat as a partisan issue. Third, and I know that Madeline's already kind of laid the ground for this, and I appreciate that very much. But third, the administration needs to work thoughtfully with peer competitors, allies, and institutions as the U.S. looks to the future in arms control. It is clear that the Russian Federation and China have both been embarked on major nuclear modernization programs. Both countries take the long view and have stable, non-political decision-making when it comes to their nuclear weapons capability. To illustrate this point, in June of 2004, I made my first trip to Russia on a Hask congressional delegation with three members of our committee. We met with Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister at the time, to discuss possibilities for U.S.-Russian cooperation in sharing early warning radar data in the context of ballistic missile defense. Sixteen years later, Foreign Minister Lavrov is still there, and Russia continues to take the long view. As the next administration looks at the extension or potential modification of New START, it is essential to pursue negotiations with a long-term strategic view. And from a policy perspective, one would be wise to note that throughout our nation's history, most change has been gradual or incremental rather than revolutionary. In my grand strategy class, we analyzed Woodrow Wilson's failed attempt at post-World War I to have the United States enter the League of Nations. The United States Senate and American public were just not ready in 1920 for such a revolutionary idea. Those in the nuclear policy arena today will be well served by being mindful of any radical changes that might fundamentally upset the delicate nuclear deterrence equilibrium. Fourth and finally, the next administration could, should continue to focus attention on the much needed nuclear modernization, both of our infrastructure and our strategic forces. Execution of DOD and NSA programs on time and on budget is essential in order to be proper stewards of taxpayer dollars and to ensure credibility. Lock in requirements early and stay disciplined in resisting add-ons or modifications absent compelling reasons. Be open about problems. Utilize the muscle of the Nuclear Weapons Council and keep the interagency fully informed. That process really does work. Another degree of difficulty NSA faces with one of the kind facilities and unique, unique missions as noted by Jim McConnell and Bob Raines talked to this group just last Thursday. As an aside, I spent 30 months on a National Academies of Science study committee that reported out in April of this year on the Department of Energy's plans to use dilute and dispose to get rid of excess weapons grade plutonium that had previously been slated for MOX. This 30 month committee saw firsthand the intersection of pit disassembly, waste processing, Office of Secure Transportation Shipping and Waste Isolation Pilot Plant Ultimate Storage over a program that is slated to last for many decades. These one of a kind long term programs cut across multiple program lines and offices. They are hard and they require constant vigilance. That said, the good news is that the NSA workforce of feds, contractors, and industry partners is fully up to the task and can do this. That said, it's crucial for everyone leading and supervising these programs to keep their eye on the ball. I'll stop there and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to your questions. Bill, Madeline, thank you very much. Uh, uh, hearing you both uh, speak today makes me realize uh, how fortunate I was to be able to work uh, closely with both of you uh, a number of years ago now when we were working on Capitol Hill. And, and again, as you indicated, Bill, in a, in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, very good to hear from you today. We're gonna to be taking uh, questions from the audience. And so uh, there's, there's two ways you can do that. If you could please uh, either raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you. Uh, alternatively, you can uh, draft a question in the chat. If you would please uh, uh, for, for uh, ease for, for the 
question moderator, uh, please put your, your name and uh, affiliation also with your question. Uh, and that's true in the, in the uh, if you ask it uh, yourself as well. But uh, uh, before we jump to those, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, take an uh, opportunity to ask a couple questions. So this is for, for both of you. you. You both served as deputy administrator for NNSA during different administrations. If either there's a staff turnover in a second Trump administration or if there's a new Biden administration, what advice would you have for the next deputy administrator for NNSA? I'll, I'll defer to Madeline to kick us off on that one, if that's OK. OK. Um, so I would say probably, well, there are three things. One is um, make sure you have a really good relationship with whoever is the administrator and also the rest of the, of the senior leadership in the department. I think that's paramount. Uh, number two is get to know all of the staff, all of the folks that really do all the work at NNSA, at the various lab, at the various laboratories, and learn from them because you'll never know as much as they they do, and they can help you through so many of these controversies because they can help explain why things are the way they are. And finally, figure out what makes sense. I think for, you know, if you're gonna be the administrator or the deputy administrator, figure out what is your role? What makes sense for you to do? And it's gonna be different with every relationship, with every administrator, with every deputy administrator. I think in my case, it was probably mostly working on the budgets, making the trains run, doing all the interactions with um, DOD and, uh, you know, and also at the White House and uh, doing a lot of the, of the policy work. But most importantly, I think it was really working with um, all of the staff at NNSA and the labs to make sure that the work that was done uh, was done on time, was done appropriately, and that we were as transparent as we could possibly be both with the Hill, the public, and also with, um, with DOD. Well, that's a great answer, Madeline. I, I tell you, I, I could just say ditto and leave it that, but uh, I, don't, I wouldn't be earning my, my money today, would I? <laughs> so uh, I agree with everything Madeline said. Uh, very well stated, my friend. You know, the, the communications piece is, is so important. And I would suggest uh, that there's three ways of looking at this. One is communications down within the organization, within the NSA. The second is uh, up within the Department of Energy to the secretary, deputy secretary, and the other undersecretaries. And the third is external with uh, Congress, uh, American public, and the interagency. All of those are important. And you have to get that right and recognize that communications means everything. And to avoid false starts, uh, miscommunications, You've got to get those communications right the very first time. The second piece, and there's kind of an adjunct to that is, and as Madeline alluded to it, uh, it's possible that whatever, whatever next administration is uh, takes office in January, that there might be some changes in policies. And so early on being clear for the new administration, what policies are they continuing from the prior administration or which ones are they changing do not be ambiguous about that. And it's okay to say, we don't know yet, but be very clear in stating what the policy is. All right, we lost, looks like we lost Bill. I hope he's able to sign back on. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Hopefully it was Bill. Wave, uh, Jeff Wave, if you can hear me, okay. Okay, that was Bill then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I lost it and I, I signed back on, so we're All here. Right, right. Oh, good. I don't know if you remember exactly where you were, but... Uh, what was... You, I think I was finishing up when I said about the transition of policies. Yes, you were speaking of that, yes. Yeah, I just said, you know, be clear with the different groups in NSA and the Department on the Hill about Hey, we're continuing this policy or not, uh, or these policies are yet to be determined, but don't be ambiguous about what you're trying to communicate. I'll stop there, 
David. All right. So, so I was thinking who we, we have on this call today, we have folks from the current federal government uh, agencies and so forth. We have folks from Congress. We have industry, academia, national labs, et cetera. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some uh, the press. Uh, all of them uh, would love to have an opportunity to speak with you or your staff in that role. Um, and so talk about that. How, how would you, at least in your experience, how did you make yourself available? How did uh, you or your staff, I know you, you didn't necessarily have time every, for every call or inquiry, and how did you make, keep yourself current and fresh with uh, making sure you did make time for some of those folks? I'm sure these, some of these folks would really like to know, boy, how do I get to a deputy administrator at NSA? Because uh, I have something important to say, but how'd you guys do that? How did each of you make time and, and make it possible for, for folks on the outside or from other parts of the government speak with you? Mally, can I start off there? Please. Yeah, so uh, I think it's important to, you know, the, the principal deputy has to manage his or her calendar very carefully. And you had to do that with some zeal to ensure you allow opportunities and open spots in your calendar to meet with people on short notice. Um, I think that's really crucial. I had, I had an open door policy at NSA. I had one at the NRC and I blocked out especially in RC, because we had a lot of public interface there on nuclear issues. I blocked out two hours a week, just for free times in my calendar. If I wanted to meet with somebody and they wanted to meet with me, I could do that. Uh, but you have to tell your scheduler that that's a, a priority and make it real by virtue of how you execute your calendar. I think that's just crucial. Very good. I think I would probably add that it that there's it's way more than just the deputy administrator and you have to look at in conjunction with your external affairs folks your congressional affairs folks and the administrator uh, what are the topics that need to be addressed what are the questions that are coming and figure out how everybody's going to uh, respond to those questions sometimes the questions are pretty um, are pretty detailed and at that at that point, you might want to bring in your deputy administrators or some of your office directors to have those conversations. Uh, other times, I found it at least very useful to have groups of people. Uh, so uh, did several conversations with the uh, Energy Communities Alliance. Um, it's a, I always found it a good opportunity if you can meet with more than one person at a time because you get a lot of shared interests. You get a lot of... Um, uh, better discussion and a lot a good some good exchanges of views sometimes like that but it just I mean it just depends um, it's a super important uh, aspect of the job but it's not just the the duty of the of, of the um, principal deputy it really is an agency wide um, effort. David, let me let me add one other thought. Madeline stirred a, something I want to recall for the group. Um, I'm sure Madeline did something like this as principal deputy, but. I met almost every day with our Congressional Affairs Office and uh, wanted to make sure that I was attuned to what current questions were coming in. Uh, and also, I wanted to make sure we had a consistent message that was accurate. And one cannot over communicate too much with your Congressional Affairs staff. Very good, thank you. Well, we, we got some questions coming in from the audience uh, through chat, which is fine. I'll, uh, that's you can do it that way, or you can raise your virtual hand. But uh, let me uh, let me see. I don't see any on the virtual hand yet, but I have several here. So let me take them in turn. So Alan Tate from the NNSA Sandia field office asked, with the preponderance of facilities within NNSA that require significant investment to restore nuclear deterrence infrastructure capability, how would you suggest NNSA approach the next administration Congress to garner support for investment? Well, I want to just personally acknowledge Alan Tate. He and I were shipmates on USS Newport News over 30 years ago. So I'm glad that he, NSA is very fortunate to have a person of his talent uh, there out of Sandia. Alan, great to, great to hear your question. Uh, I think it kind of goes back to 
communicating where you are in the nuclear modernization effort. Madeline addressed it. I've addressed it very briefly. And the, the, this modernization effort is very complicated. Obviously, the infrastructure side, we've all dealt with the old buildings. We've dealt with the, uh, those issues. Uh, we don't need to go into that history. Um, I think it's just a matter of really bringing home and communicating the importance of revitalizing this infrastructure because of the importance of the mission. You need to have facilities that en enable accomplishing that mission. I would certainly agree with that. Um, it is uh, certainly I found, and I, I presume Bill did when he when he was at NNSA as well. Is it's a it's a it's a never ending communications process because people are changing, and also the the folks that have an interest will change. Some people will have an interest, and then they'll move on to something else. So it, it's just a constant change. And one of the things that I found really helpful is to develop a very concise, very clear, very accurate um, presentation as to what the problems are, what needs to be done, and really emphasize the long-term nature of all of the modernization. When you look at these buildings and you have even the, a lot of the new buildings were built in the 70s, they're just not fit for the purposes for which they were designed and you need new buildings. And this is a long-term effort. And that to me is one of the most important uh, messages that it, that it is long-term, that um, it needs consistent funding as Bob Rains and Jim McConnell talked about last week. And it, it takes a lot of work to build that support and that understanding for the Hill. So it's just all day, every day. Thanks. Very good. I have a question here from Lily Coney from Congresswoman Jackson Lee's office. Uh, she, she brings up that the U.S. for decades has led in the fight for global reduction of nuclear threats. The efforts of Russia and China to modernize their programs have not been in the mainstream media. Does the next administration need to be prepared to present the argument for the U.S. to consider its posture and where our nation needs to be to continue to lead on the issue of nuclear safety and deterrence? So, of course, the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, the, the question is really how to how to manage and how to balance. Uh, and I'll sort of go back to where I started that the relationship of having a strong deterrent uh, and a safe, secure, reliable, effective stockpile uh, is part and parcel of working to have reductions because you can't get to those reductions unless you really do come to it with a position of strength. The uh, the second thing is really figuring out a way to have very productive discussions uh, with Russia and with uh, so that whatever the next um, administration, you know, whoever it is, whatever this next term is, um, those relationships have to be improved to the point that these discussions can be held. Um, and I'll, I just want to make one side comment on that is, um, even in the depths of the Cold War, the US and, and the Soviet Union had lots and lots of discussions. The arms control negotiations that went on for years were useful in the sense that they allowed each side to understand each other. Um, one of the things that worries me right now is there is so much, um, maybe there are so many antibodies in terms of having these discussions that it's almost impossible to have productive discussions. Part of, part of the reason is there are also a lot of congressional prohibitions on having these discussions. If we're to make progress in this agenda, those, those prohibitions have got to go away. We, you know, any administration has got to be free to have serious comprehensive discussions with the, with the potential adversaries. Sorry, that's a, a very long answer, but as you can tell, I feel a little bit strongly about this. I just I like to add one thing. Uh, I, I agree with Madeline's comments. I, for Lily's question, I'd like to also just add that I think the various nuclear posture reviews of various administrations, whether it's Democratic or Republican, doesn't make any difference, have done a pretty good job of uh, portraying what is viewed as the threat as of the time of that NPR. Uh, I know that uh, I teach the NPR my nuclear weapons class, and I know I've had Dr. Sufer come speak to that class before and appreciate his work on it. And some people may agree or disagree with some of the things in there, 
but I think that's the statement of the administration's belief of here's where the threats are and where the United States needs to go. It's important for Congress to understand and the public to understand that. Very good. Well, uh, thank you. I have a question here from, from Peter Husey from the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. So our uh, co-host today and uh, Peter, thanks very much for all your help on the entire NSA series and, and uh, happy to ask your question. So, so right now the continuing resolution runs until December 11th, 2020. Uh, some are postulating that regardless of, of the election outcomes, we should uh, have a CR run in, in, into March 2020 or even for the entire fiscal year. Uh, for, for those of you that were on the, the forum last week, we heard Jim McConnell and Bob Rains from NNSA uh, talk about the, the impacts of a CR on programs and preventing new starts. From your prior roles, what, what concerns would you have with a six month or a 12 month CR versus a completed budget? Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I mean, I would certainly defer to, to Jim and Bob because they're, they're much closer to this. But when you hear everybody who has any sort of a program management responsibility talk about this, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult um, to manage programs under CRs because you don't have the flexibility that you need in your program to increase things, to start new things. It's a, it's a difficult situation. And for the most part, it tends to in the long run, increase the costs of um, individual programs and in many respects, um, really perturb their schedule. I agree with Madeline's comment. And I, I think the Appropriations Committee staffs, from my experience, both at NSA and the NRC, the Appropriations Committee staffs are pretty good about making sure they fully understand the impacts of a CR. It puts a burden on the agency to make sure that they fully articulate what these imp impacts may be, especially on new start issues or construction or in a construction where maybe last year is year two uh, and the funding wasn't very high, but year three is now the year we're talking about and that ramp up doesn't, you know, can't happen because of the increase. And as Madeline mentions, in those kinds of situations, the overall project cost in almost all cases increases above a non-CR environment. So it's, it's important for everybody to understand what's at stake. Very good. I have a question here from Terry Lane from Zenger News. Is one year extension of the START Treaty with Russia an opportunity to get China included in negotiations? What are the limitations of a treaty without China included? Bill, you teach a class on that? You want to take well, that? You know, I, uh, I have a student writing a paper on this exact topic for a, for a, uh, a 30 page research seminar right now, and I've not seen the answer that she's going to provide. <laughs> the paper's not due yet. I, I don't know. I mean, that's a great question. And I think, quite frankly, uh, I know that the current administration has tried to reach out to China uh, in the context of the new start extension with the Russian Federation. It's my understanding, just from what I see in the open press, and that's all the insights I have, is that China declined to participate, saying that the relative sizes of the arsenals are uh, not close enough to allow China to have a motivation to engage in that discussion. I really think that this is a question for China to try to shed some light on, on it. Um, I don't know. I don't have any other insight. Madeline, maybe you have a perspective from your position. No, I, not, not, I mean, obviously, I have no insight into what the current negotiations are. Um, I, and the, again, just a personal view is the U.S. and Russia still have uh, on the order of 90 percent of the world's nuclear weapons and making sure that the caps that exist in the current New START treaty is, as I mentioned earlier, make sure that those caps um, get extended, at least on the strategic systems, is um, extraordinarily important. The second piece is with those caps extended, it will allow some room, uh, hopefully, to have the discussions with Russia on the non-strategics. Um, China should be, I, I think China is a very separate discussion. Um, and that we, we still need to focus on Russia as Russia. 
uh, we don't have a history with China. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Some very early discussions, maybe transparency, maybe agreements, maybe those sorts of things. Um, but it's also one of the reasons why I think um, there are a couple things that could uh, help with the with the sort of general discussions with with China on treaties, and that's why I suggested maybe ratification by both the U.S. and China, some sort of an agreement by both the U.S. and China to ratify the CTBT might be that toe in the water to have some discussions um, down the road on how you would approach things. But it's a it's a very different topic. Um, I think trying to push everything into one runs the risk of, you know, sort of boiling the ocean and not getting anything accomplished. So I I would take these in small incremental steps myself. Okay, I have a question from Aaron Mehta uh, from Defense News. Um, did I say that right? I think it's from for Defense News. It's, it's cut off here, but I think it's Defense News. Sorry, Aaron, if I got it wrong. Um, would you recommend another nuclear posture review should a new administration come in and how quickly does that have to happen given the key decisions on projects like W93 and uh, that are coming down the pipeline? And I guess I'd like to, I'm gonna add on to Aaron's, he didn't ask this, but I'm, I'm gonna take the prerogative to ask additional. Has there been enough change uh, since, since the uh, 2018 nuclear posture review for if, if, if there is a second Trump administration for them to do another nuclear posture review. So that's my, I'm adding that on to the question. I'll take a stab here and then Madeline can, uh, I'm sure will uh, have, have her own thoughts. Uh, for the first part, if it's a, if it's a new administration coming in, if it's, if it's a president elect Biden scenario, I would think that administration would want to have their own uh, stamp on the nuclear posture whatever that stamp might be. And uh, it's, again, going back to comments we both made earlier, it's important to be clear and unambiguous about what your policy is and what goals you're trying to achieve. I think it's difficult to do that uh, without spending time with your own administration to come to some final position. Now, such a final position might be dependent upon the outcome of these discussions and the last question about New START extension and where that ends up between the United States and the Russian Federation. Uh, my personal view with respect to a, a, a second pre President Trump administration might be a little bit different. I think there uh, a new nuclear posture view could be done, but is not is probably less crucial. Uh, with the, with the situation being, all right, Bill. <laughs> Madeline, do you have anything you want to add there? <laughs> well, we lost we lost Bill. Although I I, I certainly um, think that if there is a second Trump administration, um, probably only minor adjustments would be necessary to their their nuclear policies. Um, these things are sort of long-term documents. So, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't see them doing any, any major changes. Um, if there is a Biden administration, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, one of the things that I think we need to really look at um, carefully is sort of the traditional ha habit of stove piping all of these reviews. So you end up with the cyber and a space and a missile and a nuclear and all of these sort of strategic cross-cutting things get binned in their own stovepipes. And doing that in many respects takes away from how, how, how one should think about deterrence um, and, 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 and really look at the right whole. So while recognizing that you have to do deep dives in all these different topics, making sure that they truly are linked together in um, an integrated way so that you have this whole of government approach to deterrence um, is, is really, is really um, important, I think. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I suggested reading some of John Warden's work on integrated nuclear and conventional deterrence, because I don't think we're well served um, by always having uh, plans that there's almost a footnote that said, hmm, if things go nuclear, call STRATCOM. 
um, and without thinking about how all of this would unfold in some sort of a unified way. So, so whether it's you know a continuation of these individual or integrated um, a new a by we definitely have to take this review. I just hope it's a more holistic. Very good. I have, uh, we now have Bill Ossendorf through my phone line. So I hope everyone will be able to hear him and he'll be able to hear you, but uh, we'll test that here in a moment. It's not the first time we've done it this way. So we'll, 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 we'll let it run. I, I do have another question um, here from uh, Dave Nault from uh, Blue Residium Space Alliances. And, and, and the gist of his question is, is, is about NC3, Nuclear Command Control and Communications, and that a lot of the discussion so far has been uh, on, on deterrence and, and, and with regards to the large facilities and, and, uh, and, 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 and weapon systems. And so he wants to know, uh, you know, he wants to ask about modernization with, with regards to NC3 and how that fits into this as well. Were you able to hear that, Bill? I, I could, yeah. Uh, can you hear me in the phone here, David? Yes, we can all hear you. Yeah. I, I'm not familiar with the exact details or the funding lines for nuclear command and control modernization. I will say, uh, from my 26 years in active duty and having carried nuclear weapons on many submarines, that in my understanding of where things are today, it's absolutely vital this move forward. I mean, this is such an important area to ensure confidence in our deterrent structure, and the, the NC3 is just at the front center of that. So, uh, very important. I'll just stop right there. Okay. I completely agree. It's the backbone that holds everything together. Um, you know, this this whole effort doesn't get talked about much for obvious reasons. But um, when Secretary Carter was um, Secretary of Defense, um, I mean, he, he probably knows as much about this as anybody. And he really pushed hard to to jumpstart this whole effort to modernize it. And at least my understanding is that um, the current administration, the Trump administration has certainly continued on um, in this regard. So it's just, you know, there's so much that isn't public. It's, it's, it's hard to have a, a, a public knowledgeable conversation on this, but as I say, it is important. And my understanding is that it is. Okay, very good. It looks like, uh, you know, we're a few minutes past the top of the hour. If it's okay, we're gonna we'll go to about four fifteen. I got three more questions, so we'll we'll limit it to these three questions, and then uh, we'll wrap up this session. There's obviously a lot of interest, so we'll have to have both of you back. But let's let's uh, quickly uh, try to see if we can answer these questions. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Bob Vince from Spa, and and it matches a little bit, uh, Madeline, uh, uh, something that you brought up in your remarks. But I'll give you a chance to add anything further, and add, give a chance for Bill to reply. He, uh, Bob brings up that recently our Hask chair, Representative Adam Smith, indicated that he's, he's confident that a Biden administration will consider minimum deterrent nuclear arsenal. How would a minimal uh, nuclear deterrent approach change the needed investments at NNSA? So, okay, Bob, that's not, you know, that I get it. It's a good question. It's probably not an answerable question because initially, we have a we have a rough understanding of what China means by minimal deterrent. The U.S. is the U.S. really would need to explore what this is, um, but I mean, as we all know, at the moment, um, NSA can't even produce one pit, right? And so, if you're going to have a minimal deterrent, you have to produce some number of pits. So, I, I don't even know what that translates to. In many respects, even the goal of 80 seems seems to be sort of manageable and reasonable looking at the size of the stockpile, particularly if we are able to decrease the size of the stockpile going forward. But th there's just so much, uh, you know, I, I'm not even sure where to begin on that question. There's just so much just, uh, uncertainty associated with that. So I'll defer to Bill because he's the academic. <laughs> uh, I've seen the headline that all are we referring to. Uh, I do not have any insight into what uh, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee believes might be a minimum deterrence posture. So I, I really don't know what to say. I, uh, 
don't have any, any insight. I do believe, though, that uh, certainly if there is a new administration that comes in, the administration will have the opportunity to conduct its own nuclear posture review and make its own decisions, and uh, we'll see what happens. All right, very good. I got a question from Bill Hone. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, from GAO. Uh, he, he asks, uh, as noted, NSA has extensive wide ranging modernization program of record, so much so that until recently there was an appearance of too much program and not enough budget. The FY21 request may address those funding needs in short term, but as Madeline noted, there may be pandemic related and other pressures on future budgets. Question for Madeline and Bill, how do you view that? What do you view as the top modernization priorities for NNSA looking out to the future? And what principles uh, or approaches do you think future administrators should consider in choosing between com competing priorities? Well, I'll start there. Again, I kind of got, I do not have, I have not looked at the you know, last year's, you know, NSA budget, so I do not have the fidelity of uh, understanding that people on this call do. Uh, so there, there very well may be a case of where priorities have to be made. Uh, we've discussed earlier in this call, we heard from Bob and Jim last week, I think it's absolutely essential that the infrastructure modernization occur. And we just cannot continue to uh, live with some of these facilities that are so outdated and some cases where raises some questions about safety. Second piece, I'm a believer in continuing through the program of record for life extension programs, and I believe those need to move forward as, as scheduled. Uh, but without further knowledge of the details that one might be asking about here, I'll, I should probably just stop at that point. So I would just add one thing. I mean, I completely agree with Bill that one of the top priorities has to be health and safety of the workforce. Um, and certainly ensuring that we have viable current. The other thing that I think is um, absolutely essential is continuing to support the science, looking at the research, looking at the facilities that are needed, because if you don't have that science underpinning, which takes years and years to, to both sustain and to grow, um, it sort of doesn't matter what gets funded down the road because without the knowledge, it's very difficult to have either a deterrent or non-proliferation goals or any of the things that NNSA does. So um, those would be my two priorities, the health and safety of the workforce and, and the science spaces. Okay, we got our last question. And I think uh, Dan Leone's got a perfect question here for you. Dan, uh, Dan Leone, from, he's editor of the Exchange Monitor Nuclear Industry Trade Publication. Okay, he says it's the time of year where it's always worth asking. <laughs> but more problems with Bill. He may not get to answer. This is all for you, Madeline, unless we get Bill in back through the uh, Zoom call. His question is would, would either of you, would either of our speakers, consider further government center under any conditions? No comment. <laughs> I, I sort of figured that might be the answer. I, I think I can answer that same thing for Bill, although I, I hate to presume. Hey, uh, sorry we had some technical uh, issues with uh, Bill today, but boy, what a, a terrific uh, forum today. Uh, let me first just say thank you so much to our sponsors that helped make this possible, this, this forum and the ones we have all year. So thanks very much to our sponsors. Thank you so much uh, to uh, Peter Husey and, and the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining. We have a great audience, great questions, and, and especially Madeline and, and Bill will we'll share with Bill as well. Uh, thanks so much for a really great program and, and giving us a lot of good information today. So until we uh, see you again soon, thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>